YouTube. It's Brian Phillips. We have this little dinky box here. We're gonna open up right now. It's gonna be amazing. If you're new to Brian Phillips RC, we open these things, we unbox them, we build them, and then we do the radio setup if it's an airplane. What do you think this is, camera crew? Hmm. It's not a bike. You sure about that? Well. It it's an 1800 millimeter Ranger. Oh yeah, there's LEDs on there, sweet. Oh, it's green. Yeah, green and white. Cool. Super excited for this. Okay, so obviously FMS makes a mean plane. And so we're gonna unbox this thing and see what it's made of. We have done recently, redone actually, the 1220 millimeter Ranger and really enjoyed it. It was a great plane. Just trying to do this without ripping the box. So don't, don't do anything to help there over okay. there. Okay, all right, there it is. And so these planes in general of this style have been really positive planes, really good. Oh, I did not know you could put floats on it. Yeah. That is so cool. Now, I don't know if this kit comes with floats, but we will let you know that as we unbox the plane. And so that's part of what we do in terms of specs. We try to show the size class, and then it is said, does say optional floats. Where's the English? Oh, it's over here on the back. That's not English. Yep. Where's the English? The back, towards your belly. That's not English. Oh, it's on the back of the box. Ah, I see. Here we go. Features. Wonderful. Okay. There it is. 3541, 750 KV Outrunner. Very nice, 45 amp ESC. We've noticed that sometimes on the FMS planes, the boxes do not always match. They're sometimes bigger than what they actually display on the outside. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna see how this goes. We'll unbox it and show you what it's like inside. And at the end of the day, there's a million planes you can find online and there's a million choices. And sometimes they're really good and other times they're not so good. We're gonna try to help you decide between the good, the bad and the ugly. And they pretty much all look good online. online. And so this one, okay, you gotta reach in here kind of a long ways. There's the edge, you can grab this edge. I hate breaking the foam on the way out. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine. This thing has like suction going on here. Okay, so also I just wanna point out, we really like this style of playing uh, in the beginner arena, but that does not necessarily mean it's going to only be for beginners, okay? So just because a beginner could potentially fly a plane does not mean it's beginner-esque. And by the way, a lot of times people see a high wing plane and they think, oh, that's a trainer. That'll be easy to fly. That's only for beginners, that sort of thing. <laughs> no, that is so wrong. And if you d disagree, then I challenge you to prove it because we have done so many high wing planes that are amazing planes, but definitely not for beginners. And a lot of it comes down to how well they go together, how cheap they are to battery up, how simple it is to set them up. And I'm gonna give you one example, which is made by FMS. They also sell a, is it called Sky Trainer? Yeah. It's a Cessna 182. And that plane was originally marketed as a beginner plane. And I think it's like a terrible beginner plane because it's actually not the easiest plane to fly. It's beautiful, but it's also not easy to build and it's not easy to set up. Yeah. Um, it used to come as a ready to fly years ago. And it, in that configuration, I think it probably would've been good as a beginner. But even then, it was heavy. It was very easy to break. This thing is gonna be hopefully the opposite of that. And I can already tell just from looking at it. They've gone the more simple route, the less detailed and beautiful decals. Very bright, oh yes, LEDs. Something that was definitely missing on the 1220. I keep pointing over here because we have ours kind of parked by that table. So my apologies if you can't see it, but big servos too, 17 gram analog servos. Uh, tape joint looks a little ugly here, but it's not gonna matter. This thing just looks really good and pretty close match on the colors here. Not mm -hmm. necessarily a deal breaker, but we try to point that stuff out. This is actually a painted and this is a decal and it almost looks intentional that there's a differential in colors. Yeah. And uh, again, that's the type of thing you're not gonna see online and it's not a deal breaker one way or another, but when you get into these scale liveries, sometimes you're gonna want them to be a, a very good match. Okay, so let's pull the other wing out. Obviously the uh, wing struts are already pre-installed. Uh, ball link, servo, horns, everything set up, ready to go, which is really nice. And let's just talk about sturdiness. 
This thing has got just a little bit of give to it, but not so much it's gonna change the shape of wing while you're flying. And then also the fact that it is an unpainted white is going to disappoint some, but I actually don't care. I think they've been fine. I would just as soon have the lightest plane you can have. Oh yes, quick release nice. on the wings. Yes, awesome. Okay, only drawback there is if you end up with the reflex versus a true plug and, plug and play is you might actually wanna put flap runs or crow on a plane like this just for extra fun. Now that being said, when you see an inboard wing type, inboard flap wing type, like what you have on this plane, can you point at the inboard flaps there? Mm -hmm. That is going to allow for very good slowdown performance. It's gonna allow for all the different things that you expect a wing to be able to do. And so our experience is the, pretty much the best type of wing type is gonna be an inboard flap on most applications. Not always, but most. And so if you want to do crow, which is where you have the ailerons act as flaperons, okay? So these would both go up simultaneously and also act as ailerons at the same time, while the inboard flaps go down and act as flaps, then that would take three total channels. But sometimes that gets challenging depending on how the wires actually interface in the fuse. We've seen a number of different FMS planes where they have mixing boards that are buried inside. So we'll talk about that when we get to that point. Even though we don't plan to set up Crow on this plane because I don't think it's necessary or I don't expect it to be necessary. I'm gonna tell you this, we did set up Crow on our 1220 millimeter just because we had the channels to do so and it was kind of a fun thing. But that plane doesn't even come with flaps. We added the inboard flaps and all. Unfortunately, we did not film that stage of it because I did it with my friend Esteban. Mm -hmm. Okay, so cutting this. Kind of a little bit ambiguous how that's supposed to come apart. So fortunately it came apart the way I expected. And as you can see, you've got all this good stuff in here. Oh my goodness. They practically rolled a doobie out of our freaking instruction manual. <laughs> Gosh, we should just burn it right now. That's ridiculous. Okay, anybody that's working at the factory, please don't fold manuals, you don't need to. Anyway, not a big deal. Except it drives me crazy. Okay, so there's your manual. And the thing that's irritating is that the manuals are actually quite good from FMS. Yeah, they are. Um, and so we don't have anything to complain about there except for if they fold them. 12 by 7.5, you can tell here. The print also usually helps you to indicate which side goes forward if there's any ambiguity. Now this one's pretty obvious. There's this um, hexagonal drive here with the cylinder opening. That's gonna have the shaft for the drive pass through it. Oh, and then here's the spinner. It's sitting right there, so I'll grab it right now. So the spinner, of course, is going to trap this in the middle. Looks like that drive is gonna get passed through to the, yeah, but there's no texture on there. That's kind of weird. Then this is gonna go around it like that. Looks like kind of a small prop for a big plane. I guess we'll see how that goes. Oh, and then look, a USB-C to USB-A. We'll just kind of put that where it belongs. that over there. Goodness gracious, I'll let the plane. I almost hit the plant there. <laughs> Oops. Those are totally useless, but that means we must have a reflex in here. Um, I guess we're gonna find out here soon enough. That cable is used for updating the reflex. They have a simple application that basically lets you choose what plane you're hooked to. It does not give you any way to change the settings of the reflex itself. At least not that I found. Okay, nut and bolt sack, antenna, a couple of different fittings and stuff. This is gonna go, of course, with the spinner. This must be a float adapter, I bet. This might be float adapters too, but we'll find out here shortly. Okay. Show this bag off to the side. Okay, vertical stabilizer and rudder. Very robust, pre-built, ball link. Nice looking decals. Big plastic adapter that's glued in to the vertical stabilizer. And you don't have to worry about this elevator because you've got a lot of thickness and beefiness to it. This is gonna look like the back of the fuse. And then of course the rudder plug. So you've got one, it looks like probably a nine gram servo, kind of hard to be 100% sure. But that looks very, in terms of strong, looks very strong. And then just kind of holding it up to the light here, you can see there's not a lot of reinforcement in it, but it doesn't need it or it's white fiberglass. It feels pretty sturdy. I don't know how that could be not reinforced. 
Nose gear looks like a spring-loaded Oleo. Very nice looking. Got a lot of spring in it though. And then 2.5 inch. This is made out of uh, titanium alloy. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. It's extremely hard though. Goodness gracious. So that's one complaint we've had over the years. As these models have gotten better and better, the tires have stayed very rock hard. Now, I'm gonna admit something. Hinge looks really good on this, but it is a pinch hinge. And I don't see any reinforcements. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking at the light passing through this hinge, okay? Now they are tied left to right very sturdily here. And so there's gonna be a good symmetrical movement action there. And then this is just a hole. In terms of twist, oh, very little twist, if any. Okay, so that's good. Elevator and horizontal stabilizer. Looks like a wing joiner, very thick walled. Not very huge in terms of overall size, but thick walled. See that? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's definitely gonna be fine there. Nice and sturdy, definitely carbon fiber and not fiberglass. You can tell the difference when you bounce them on the hard surface like what we just did there, okay? So landing gear, a little bit of reinforcement with these Z-bends or bends like this, and then these things should pop off if they break. So you've kind of got this like simulated fairing here, and these are made out of uh, diamond, painted black, just kidding. Again, they're made out of foam, but way, way, way too hard foam. And we're gonna go ahead and pull the main fuse out. Oh yeah, that feels really nice. Looks gorgeous. Cessna 150 style, 150, of course. But I don't know, they must not have paid the rights or they would have said that. Nose light, exhaust port here for the engine. Very cool, good, good in, inlet here. Screws make it serviceable so this front end can come off. You can get down to your mounting screws for the, uh, for the motor. And then let's, uh, let's flip over the box and make sure I didn't miss anything. Boy, that'd be a great place for like a manual, like a big flat It'd thing. It'd be like flat, kind of. Kind of nice. Okay, so as you can see, piece count is very minimal, but there are a few pieces. And so if you guys don't have a plane stand, my suggestion is that you would get yourself a plane stand. Something like this would be fine. This is Robart. Uh, there's nothing particularly magical about this. But let's talk about this fuse for just a second longer. The other thing you'll notice about this plane and some planes like it is that they have a very basic non-glass or not simulated glass uh, canopy and cockpit area. Now, that's a double-edged sword because a lot of times you add a lot of extra weight, like the mall, for instance. The mall has simulated glass all around and it's beautiful. And when you do passes in sunset, you see the light shining through, but the double-edged sword becomes you have an open cavity which then needs to be closed off from the rest of the plane to make it look good. And you have a cockpit that's got a pilot in it. And then the pilot is usually not quite the right size and they've got like some weird bug-eyed look to them and just certain <laughs> things like that. So I think it's a double-edged sword. Also, if you're gonna get into a more performance type plane, which this is probably going to be in that range, I haven't flown it before, so I'm not 100% certain, then you want to keep it as simple as possible without giving up that performance nature, okay? This sharp edge is going to weather poorly because it's made of foam, okay? I don't like sharp edges like that. Also inside of here, you can see you've got the Reflex V2 and lots of wire going everywhere. And the ESC, they had claimed it was gonna be 45, it is 45, and no thrust reverse on this particular Predator ESC. It is equipped with an XT60, which will work with an EC3. Looks like we have a split opening to gain access to the steerable nose gear. And yes, that little adapter that we saw was for the nose gear. We saw it earlier, it's a plastic white thing. That's right here, guys. So that's gonna be for the nose gear. Ask me how I know, camera crew. Um, well, we've done this a few times. We've done it a few times, exactly. Now, in order that we can have the best possible outcome on this model, we might just take a quick second and peruse the manual and show you what to expect inside of there before we dig in any deeper. But I can definitely tell you this looks like it's gonna be a good size plane. And it's definitely, because remember this wingspan is pretty big, but that's gonna be centrally located. 
and uh, that's gonna be a big, big wingspan. Mm -hmm. So remember, 1800 millimeters is big. The yellow one in the back, the biggest one is 2000 millimeters. That's a two meter plane. The blue in front is a 1.5. The one behind is 1.1, just to give you an idea. When you get a 1.1 compared to a two, it's not 0.8 millimeters or 0.8 meters difference in size. It's everything is scaled up. It's not just the wings. The wings are scaled up. The size of the vertical stabilizer, the size of the horizontal stabilizer, the size of the chest of the actual, you know, the uh, fuselage, the landing gear, everything gets bigger. And that can be a double-edged sword too. But we really tend to think that most of the time, the bigger models are gonna give you a more robust experience. Not necessarily a better experience, just a different experience. And then depending on their overall speed, they sometimes tolerate the wind a little bit better. Also, this is where you're gonna notice your difference in size is in packaging. I noticed that this plane actually comes in a pretty small package for being a big plane, mm -hmm. okay? There are some planes that take huge boxes, huge boxes to get a plane this size to your doorstep. Now, that being said, I think that this is kind of the best of both worlds. There's a little bit of length loss on your vertical stabilizer if you wanna show them what I'm pointing at. And then basically what that's gonna do for you is you also have to sometimes build a little bit more. For instance, I believe the Carbon Z has no nose on it. And so you have a little bit more assembly so they can save some distance here. And I believe on that and the Carbon Z, Cessna 152T, or Cessna 150T. 150T, yep. You have to add the vertical stabilizer comes without the rudder, if I remember right. And same thing with the Carbon mm -hmm. Z Cessna, or the Carbon Z Cub, which incidentally are all made by FMS. But there is a little bit more assembly in, involved. So just keep in mind, the other thing is if the manufacturers don't hold down the size of this package here, you're gonna have a harder time seeing them in stock and you're gonna have more expensive shipping yeah. if you have to bear the shipping cost. Some of the manufacturers build that in, some of them don't. And some of them that, that do uh, build it in, you end up just having a higher MSRP. So, all right, so in, in kind of thinking through the build, we're gonna have some anti-slip pads that we're gonna put here. We're gonna need to double check what receiver we wanna use. Now I can just tell you right now, this plane, the way it's set up, I'm gonna want at least throttle, elevator, rudder, ailerons, flaps, mode would be preferable. So that's six channels. So that makes a really easy choice for us. There is an AR620. In fact, we'll pause and grab it and I can show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so the AR620 is what I would suggest for a model like this. Now, if you don't like the 620 and you wanna do like a lemon or whatever, that's fine. It's gonna give you a similar performance uh, on a little bit cheaper budget. But the end of the, at the end of the day, oh, and I just noticed something. Show them this reflex. My reflex isn't mounted straight. Do you see that? It's kicked at an angle. Mm -hmm. That's gonna make the plane literally fly in an angle. I'm just gonna break it, break it off right now before I forget. If you ever have to do this, it's annoying, but sometimes you'll notice this. That is spatially aware, and I'm just gonna center it, okay? I just centered it, okay? It wasn't hard, it was easy, and now the thing is centered, okay? But I need to now keep an eye on I need to now keep an eye on that and make sure that it's snapped down together. Okay, so it's snapped down together, but now it's straight in line with the plane. Okay, if you ever have a stabilizer or a stabilized receiver like this, which also has telemetry, AR637T is gonna give you the, the barometer for altitude, so you can have a boop, 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 beep, 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 which you wouldn't typically need in a plane like this, but it's also going to give you AS3X and safe. So if you wanted to tear out your reflex and go straight with this for all your stabilization, then you can mount this centrally, horizontally, vertically, upside down, whatever. But it is spatially aware, and so it needs to become one with your plane, whereas the 620 can just be plugged in and like literally thrown in there loose, okay? Now, I'm not gonna throw it in there loose, but I am gonna potentially stuff it into some weird spot. Just make sure that whatever is spatially aware in your plane is either lined up straight or you have made some sort of a correction for it in your radio setup, which you can do with this, but not that I know. I don't believe you can with the reflex, okay? <laughs> so you wanna be real careful about getting that thing straight. I'm not sure why that wasn't straight, but it wasn't a big deal. All right, so we're gonna go with a 620 on this. That's gonna give us some mode, and it's gonna give us flexibility to do all the features we want. Now, if you wanted to save 
reset your mode and then leave it and then unplug it, you could then plug in one of the ailerons and still set up Crow. But again, I don't think you really need it and you are gonna give up stabilizer via the reflex if you do that. So there's gonna be an added layer of complexity and it might actually adversely impact your flight performance. Now, if you want the middle ground between something like this and something like this, so like you still want the telemetry, I think it's called the 6610, it looks just like this. It's gonna give you that telemetry feedback. This is actually wired in parallel with your battery line. And then you would pay considerably less than this, but more than this. And that's gonna give you the telemetry so you can have your pack voltage, okay? So of course, pack voltage, flight pack voltage, meaning your LiPo that flies the plane. Um, now you're gonna get your receiver voltage telemetry through this anyway, but that doesn't really do you much good just for understanding sake. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and build this plane right now. We might take a quick sec, clean things up, get ready to set, and you guys stay tuned. We're gonna build it next. All right, so we organized the nut and bolt sack here. So we got these two clips that go on the bottom. They're gonna actually hold these things on, the uh, wing struts. Then there's one of these two black ones that's gonna hold this on the end of the nose fixture here. Okay, so of course you gotta pass that through first but uh, that'll be ready to go. And so we'll just put these screws together. Then these are gonna go with the landing gear, the mains, okay? And then these are gonna go for your wings, and these are gonna go for the horizontal stabilizer and vertical stabilizer. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure there's one that's gonna hold on the, the spinner. The same size that you need for the gear. Like that. So the same size that, that I need for the gear? Mm -hmm. Really? That's what the manual says. This one? Yeah, the 10. So that does leave us an extra. Now, yes. back in the day, it used to be consistently true that FMS provided one additional screw of each type, unless it was some weird screw. So my expectation is we're gonna be doing the same thing. All right, so I'm gonna start with a tail because I can flip the tail upside down. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is I need to lay this on here. And the second thing I need to do is plug in this rudder the rudder has the brown down, so I'm gonna just spin this until the brown is down. Cam crew is gonna take her hand and hold this. It helps to have a second set of hands, but then she can't focus stuff, so my bad. Okay, so that's plugged in. Now I can just let this fall down. It's taped in here. So I'm actually gonna leave it taped and just slide this in with my fingers. This goes in forward, just guiding that little rudder label down, okay? Then this kind of pushes down pretty straightforward stuff, not hard, but uh, definitely just something that has to be done. Now I'm gonna put my canopy back on real quick and I have to flip this upside down. Now there's a reason I didn't do the landing gear first. It's because the landing gear and the tail are gonna take about the same amount of effort, okay? But this way I can have this all mounted and ready to rock and roll. Okay, and with a two millimeter driver, I'm gonna slide in and just look at that gap on the tail at the back. Is it moving? Is it not? It is not yet. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the front and try to get that started. You're probably thinking to yourself, it's not moving, Brian, what are you doing wrong? I need to close that gap by holding down. You see my elbow with my left hand? See how I'm pushing the plane down? Mm -hmm. Now it's biting. I show that because I'm on a plane stand and I still have to think through how to hold both sides at the same time. Okay, now this is obviously where the linkage is gonna go to. That's for the elevator. Now I'm not gonna put it on yet because we don't actually know if that's centered yet. Okay, so now that I'm just going until I can feel some really serious squeezing here on this foam. I'm gonna watch here. Yep, see that's starting to pull that down. So that bearing surface is gonna get flattened out. Now, while we've got it upside down, I can go ahead and do the rest of my landing gear. Now, keep in mind, your floats are gonna go here and here. There'll be a second set of ribs, if you will. Now, I don't know which way, I didn't pay close enough attention, did you? I did not. We might need to take a second and do that. We'll come right back. It goes on the back side, and they can't forward slightly, okay? So if you look at this, the wing, they point forward just a little teeny bit, okay? Now, if you put them in backward, will it fit? Probably, and it's gonna look kind of dumb. It's definitely supposed to go forward, 
Gosh, I don't know. Since I said that, now I got to, yeah, it's definitely supposed to be canon forward Does as in what the, the manual says. And I also looked at the picture too, camera crew. Okay. But they do go backwards, so you got to be careful. With them. You can mount them either way, and I'm sure you'd be fine, but it's just going to look wrong. Okay. Okay, then these things slide into one side or the other, so just guess and check until you get the right size or the right side. Okay. Yep, and they pressure fit in there pretty tight. That's going to be terrible to have to take that out later because they really, 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 really press in hard. Okay, so now same two millimeters, and I'm using the shorter ones, shorter screws. Okay, so we'll just get those started. And while we're getting the first one screwed in, we can get the second one in place, plastic on plastic with the plastic, um, with the nut zert on the other end to receive it. So very easy alignment, no complexity, no difficulty. That's the way we like it. And it doesn't always work that way. So guys, you've seen it in previous builds that we've done, even some FMS models, to be frank, where we've had a hard time lining up all the screws. A lot of time that has to do with two foam pieces that come together with kind of sloppy molding on the inside where they mesh up and pair up together. We didn't have that problem on this model, which is great. All right, so now nose gear. Nose gear, the Olio has this spring-loaded system to it, and this needs to go toward the back of the plane, okay? So sliding that in, I just want to point out the fact that that fits very nice, but there's no lubricant that's called out here if you're in any question, I would probably be super careful about what you pick so as not to get, you know, any Loctite or anything that's going to be a solvent base that's going to damage that plastic. So I would go with maybe something like soap if you want to try to lubricate it. But I don't think you really need to. It's just more of a preference issue. If you're like a little bit too dry for your taste, you can lubricate it how you want. Okay, I'm just going to open this up. And then this thing, this is going to be a fun one. See how there's a flat machined into this plastic? This is gonna drop in there, straight down. And there's these two black screws oh, like this. That. Okay. Okay, so there's gonna be one extra, which is customary from some FMS products. And that happens to be Phillips. So of course we gotta get a different screwdriver from our screwdriver set. And we're gonna do this while it's out of the plane to make it as easy as possible. Okay. If you grab a Phillips screwdriver, and you put it in here and it wants to flop and fall all over itself, don't use that one. Four millimeters. There it is, that's pretty good. Okay, so now I'm gonna try desperately to do this the easiest possible way. So you see I sandwich that in? Okay. My goal is to hold this and drop it down in, but as you can see, my fingers are too big. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a pair of forceps, and if you don't know what forceps are, they're sometimes referred to as hemostats, these two pairs of forceps, one with bent tip, one without bend, so it's just straight. I'm gonna try with the bent tip first. I'm gonna go ahead and hang on to this. See, I can't quite clamp that. See how it's not closing all the way? That's because it's just too hard of a bite. So I am gonna go ahead and I'll just leave the screw in there. See, that, that's why I like these things, is I can hold an, ab, an abstract shape. You could probably step back half a step. There you go, see? I'm just going to reach in here, just drop this down, and then as soon as I start getting a little bit of purchase, then I can let go and then just take the screwdriver to draw it down. There it goes. There it is. It's in position. Now, I did just turn the servo, which is not by plan or design, but whatever. It's fine. Okay? So now that it's torqued in there, as soon as we turn on our model, it's going to self-center that. Oh, okay. Okay, so my next move is, of course, I need to get the wing installed, so I'm hoping I don't need this Phillips right away because I'm going to put this off to the side now next to our other screws. And I want to mount stuff, so I want to put this back on just in case I need something to hang on to. Now, I want to point out one thing real quick. See this? See how when I press down on this, it pushes into the foam? Very annoying feature. You see that? Why is that not plastic? Why is that not reinforced? Good question for FMS. Take the big, long, black shaft and just ram it through. Take one of the two wings. 
nothing too terribly difficult. Sometimes I try to line this up, you see with my left hand, I'm gonna try to, I gotta put some of this in here, okay? Then I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna slide it in as I'm doing the wing. Okay, so there it is, it's snapped in. And then this one's gonna snap in as well after a minute, but it wants the tip, so the camera crew is gonna hold this. And because it's all out of balance and out of whack, I'm gonna go ahead and get the other wing on temporarily while we get in to do the hardware. You're gonna have to actually hold that pretty tight. Okay. okay. Now I'm getting my wing strut lined up. Now you might be able to put that strut on and off without too much trouble, but I don't like guessing that because I always get burned every time I try to do that. Okay, so that's plugged in perfectly. Really nice fit. Got a little bit of dirtiness on my plastic though, which is disappointing. Okay, now I'm gonna take this and flip it upside down carefully. I'm gonna pay attention to the way I do it so the wings don't slip off, okay? See, I kind of kept them lateral mm -hmm. so you didn't have all the weight, pull them out of the socket. Two millimeter drive, as before. I'm gonna load that onto my driver. As you can see, I loaded it, worked perfect. So just do it like I did. And then we're just gonna turn this in. Should've probably done the landing gear last, folks. Doesn't really matter though, whatever. This has been such an easy build. I wish it were always this easy. You know. It's so funny because we do so many different planes on this channel. And if you guys are ever curious about other planes we've done in the past, all you have to do is just stroll over to brianphillipsrc.com. That's our domain. And you guys may notice that sometimes our links say bprc.me. That's our short domain. And so if you guys are following that, that should generally be one of our links. And then sometimes they're old bit.ly links or Avant links or other links like that. But one way or another, if you're ever in question, just uh, shoot us a question. And that being said, that's one of the best ways you can help support our channel financially. We know a lot of you guys love to support us on Patreon and sometimes maybe a monthly support or a gift once in a while on PayPal when you've got a little extra cash going around or you're between models. Extra screw going right here. We got five, not four, so that's good. And the other way you can support us is uh, by becoming a member on YouTube. Now I'm going to press with my elbow, excuse me, with my elbow down. That's gonna give me something to press against and kind of my forearm here and just hug the plane. And then I've got to do all this while I'm turning the screw, okay? So I can tell I've got purchase on the first couple of threads and that's good enough to get started. Now, let's see if you can do this without. Yeah, it'd be pretty hard to do that without. I would encourage you to line those up first. But you see where this is? It's lined up right next to the strut. It's just kind of an awkward spot, that's all. See how it's lined up? There's like nowhere to put your hands. So it's just kind of an awkward spot. No big deal, you can definitely get past it. But this is one of the things we run into building these models. Oh, oh, that's so annoying. I slipped my screwdriver and put a mark in the foam. Which is, reminds me, another tip for those of you that have built a lot of foamies, you'll understand this already. If you have long fingernails or you have sharp fingernails, cut your fingernails and actually take out and do the manicure stuff and like smooth the edges with sandpaper or whatever. Cause you will- Sand. Don't use sandpaper. You can use sandpaper or sanding block. That's what I use. It's the <laughs> easiest thing to do. And then when you accidentally bump it with your fingernails, it won't immediately gouge. And it's crazy how easy it is to damage these planes. That's why I don't like helping. <sighs> okay, so look, then this, this is gonna be probably a real pain in the neck cause you gotta kind of line up the two holes then once you line them up, you see I'm pushing super hard. There it is. Okay. I do not like this type of clip. Mm -mm. They're one of my least favorite types of clips, but after all, they do tend to kind of work. Okay, see, this is one of the problems I have. Sometimes my models stick to the anti-slip foam on this, and other times they just spin, and it's really frustrating. Because like when you use this as a lever arm, there's not a great place to hang on to. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna intertwine myself there it goes, it pulled tight. Now I have to go kind of at an angle. You show them the angle. See this, how I'm at an angle. <coughs> the first couple of times is always the hardest. Once you kind of ream the hole out by going in and out of it a few times, it makes it a little easier. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so now that we've got that done, you could hype, I mean, this plane's like almost built. Yeah. Isn't that crazy when we've been doing this a few minutes? That's Brian Phillips' arsenal. That's know. fast for us. Okay, now I'm straddling that front 
now that I have my, my nose gear mounted and that's gonna keep it from slipping off. Before I was just really on this like smooth spot mm -hmm. and this mold release makes it slick. I love the way this plane looks by the way. It's very basic and I have no problem with basic guys. But if you were gonna paint this plane, I would paint it yellow because yellow planes pop in the sky. I love the way yellow planes look, which is ironic because we do actually have a few yellow planes. Also, I wanted to point out the fact that I have this long extra screw here, okay? We did get the long screw too. See, look, mm -hmm. pile. Those are the extra screws. All right, so first things first, this thing slides on. Okay, so that's gonna be the backside of the spinner. Nice smooth fit, or nice smooth transaction there. Then this is gonna slide on, but just to be clear, if you don't use the spinner, you can actually do it that way too. But you're gonna have some tight, 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 tight tolerances. And you're gonna have to come up with some sort of a spinner adapter that's not gonna look dumb. I would highly suggest you use a spinner in this application and every application where a spinner is belonged. Okay, so then this, this is gonna hold it on. Very nice. Now, if you don't have a screwdriver handy, make sure you get one that's strong enough because this is actually probably a little bit too small. So I'm gonna go up to like uh, five millimeter Phillips. This might be too big. Yep, too big. So we'll go to the four millimeter. The four millimeter should just barely fit. Nope, it's too big. So we have to go down to the two millimeter. Goodness gracious, guys. All right, so now I can put this through and just use that to torque this on, okay? So that's perfect, very simple process. Probably could have just used the screwdriver I was using, okay? Now, if you look on here, there's gonna be a screw that passes through this assembly and holds the spinner on, okay? So until we get a screw, was it supposed to be the middle one? You, um, you left it out over there, the 10. A 10 what? 10 millimeter length, so it should be a two millimeter hex drive. How do you know which one to use, guys? So one that's extra. I show you that on purpose because ours disappear on our counter. And so like, I literally can't see them. Okay, so we'll just tighten this until it gets mostly tight. Do not use Loctite where it's gonna come into contact with plastic. Your plastic will break down with the solvents from the Loctite. That's the way that'll spin to go. All right, cool. So that, I mean, honestly, that's like one of the easier builds we've ever done. And uh, we have two pieces left. We have this piece, which is cool. A little scale antenna, very nice. And then we have this piece, which is going to be the linkage with a ball link adapter. And that's gonna go for the elevator. Now we do have to finish our radio setup before we could really put that in there or we would have to go ahead and use um, some sort of a... Servo You'd tester. have to use a servo tester, like the XPC 100 battery checker. And if you guys wanna do that, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. The XPC battery checker is gonna look something like this, or like this, exactly. And you plug in your servo lead on the side. This is also a battery checker. So you got the balance lead plugged there. And you energize this and it actually runs your servo to the absolute center position, which is really nice to be able to do that. Now also, let's talk about batteries for a minute. 3,300 to 4,000 is what they recommend. So I'm gonna run a 3,200 4S Gen 2. That's why you don't see a balance lead. Now, what would be nice is if we had a 4,000, which actually, now that I think of it, I think we do have a 4,000 4S. So I might go ahead and just air to the 4,000 4S. And if we have a Gen 1, it'd be nice because we have a balance lead so we can actually test our voltages while flying. Wait for the beep, 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 boop, boop, boop. And that looks like this, guys, right here. This will beep, and you can see this does one through eight S. These things are a couple of bucks each. You know, I think if you buy like two or three of them, they might be like 10 bucks. So you definitely wanna have these, and if you don't know how to use them, you plug in your balance lead to this side with the positive most side being here, and the neg negative most side being here. Okay, so like one S would be here, two S would be here, three S would be here, and so on and so forth, okay? So I was taking mark plus and minus so I can see it easier. This little thing, It's a push button. That's how you set the voltage by which the single cell threshold will activate the alarm. So if you have four cells and one of them drops below X, 
then it'll start beeping. So if you're at 3.3 for your alarm setting and it goes to uh, 3.29, it's gonna start beeping, regardless of what the other three cells are doing. Okay, so we'll know how to use that. And if we choose to use that, that's fine, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, what we might do is big out that, dig out that battery and then start the radio setup next. 4000 4S Gen 1, yeah. Why do I like Gen 1? Well, for this application, I like it. We're gonna use the S155 to charge this. This is an expensive charger compared to the S2200. The S2200 has two 200 watt chargers and they have both IC3 and IC5, which is really nice. However, you don't see a lot of 4S's with IC5. I do have at least one. Okay, so we'll just plug this in and it should initiate smart charging. There it goes. Okay, cool. So now it's gonna to start to pre-populate all the data registers and you can read them on the screen. So this is the S1200. Nothing special about that other than the fact that it's a single channel instead of a dual channel. This is single, this is dual. I far prefer, if you guys are looking at chargers, they have an S1400, which has a 400 watt charger. I would not get that unless you're like seriously into EDF jets and helis. But if you're gonna do that, you need to get into something like this. You've got some truly high power and you can put these in, in series. Okay, I've never done that, never needed to, probably won't ever need to. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this balance lead in. It starts populating the values. And then I'm gonna put my discharge lead in. That is a short balance lead, goodness gracious. Okay, so once that initiates, then it's gonna start charging. Now, part of the fun of the hobby is buying expensive batteries and having them go to crap on you. So I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars on batteries that have turned to nothing. And it's my fault <laughs> because the way I fly them. Uh, and then the other thing too that I do that's terrible is I charge them and I never discharge them. That is why I like smart batteries and you see lots of smart batteries and very few non-smart batteries like these, whatever that is, okay? Or like this, whatever that is, this one, is actually a really good pack. But the thing is, we don't have a lot of non-smart batteries. Like these, these are non-smart batteries. What happens to batteries that are non-smart that you charge and you leave sit for a long time? They go bad. They puff. And you're like, but Brian, your smart batteries are puffed too. Well, that's because I discharge them too fast. So basically, uh, you can cause problems either way, and I do both. It so congratulations to a me. lot longer though so if you want your batteries to last a long time that's probably my 3200 beeping at me yep it is the 3200 gen 2s will be nice for this plane but it's a little bit harder on us because we don't have that balance lead we won't see the warning in addition to the timer because we'll set a timer for kind of like an assumed time frame and when that time frame is up then we'll just kind of look for the initial signs of a dead battery and then i will crash if it's a J11. <laughs> Hopefully you guys have already seen that. Anyway, uh, if you haven't seen it, keep an eye out for it. So we're gonna start with our radio setup now that we have uh, defined our batteries. Now again, like I said, if you get the 6730T and you wanna tear out the reflex, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend because it's an expensive choice, um, but this is not like a little rinky dink plane. It's a, it's a big plane with a lot of features. Yeah. Also, I might say one of the things I like most about big planes is just the fact that when you get old, as we have done, <laughs> yes. then you can see things like, where are you over there? <laughs> so if you get a big plane, you're gonna tend to have a bigger experience, but that's true for bigger crashes as well. So like, strangely enough, even with big planes, I tend to find trees with them still just because I reach out and touch them with my wings and things like this. Now, you don't have to do that, so <laughs> I'll do it for you. And then you can point and laugh at me as I crash into random objects. But at the end of the day, we wanna help you guys have a great experience and not end up in a tree somewhere because you did some stupid maneuver and Brian Phillips RC said to do so. Well, I said I would do it so you don't have to, just to be clear. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into our radio setup now, and that's gonna consist of basically setting up a pretty standard airplane. Now, one thing I do like to do real quick is we like to show the manual from time to time. This is an FMS manual. 
As you look through, sometimes they have some of the newer manuals have different things like this. This shows you where the bat battery indications are. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Okay. You can kind of see the instructions are quite simple. Everything goes pretty smooth. And here's this receiver part if you're trying to find the receiver stuff. Of course, we just hook it up and guess and check. It is all labeled for you, so it's quite simple. Okay, so then continuing along, they talk about the center of gravity here. And if you're doing this as a plug and fly, they have control throws. I don't look at that. I don't care about that. There are people that really, really, really care about it because they're used to using another brand of receiver than the manufacturer's expectation. Like if you're using a Futaba, that's fine. If you're using an Open TX, that's fine. It doesn't really matter which one you use. Of course, we're walking through using the Spectrum 620, the AR620, and that's fine too. But the thing is, if you really want to do it, as per the manual, you would have to measure your throws. I have never measured my throws, ever. Ever. Hundreds of planes. Good experience on most of them. Not all of them, <laughs> okay? So this is the little receiver we're using. It's got a push button. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's our bind button. You can also plug in a battery for like a receiver pack here, channel one through six. And if you wanna know where signal goes, you just have to look no further than the little reflection on your screen here. You're gonna have to zoom in like crazy. Do you guys see what I'm talking about? See how it says S and then it says plus and then it says minus. So S plus minus, S plus minus. That is the layout. And once you've done it once, you sort of start to figure that out, okay? And then also when we're all done with this, we'll do the center of gravity and we'll also have to install the, the control horn and uh, servo arm in the elevator on the outside and outside, okay? So outside and outside. Okay. That's why we look through this manual just to show you kind of the basic layout of the way the manual is gonna be set up for FMS. Now FMS does a pretty good job of having a consistent manual that is maybe folded sometimes and there is a little addendum in there somewhere for the reflex where if you i don't know it was like in the middle you saw it flip it just hold it up so ah, there it is. yes it's usually stuck in there somewhere yep so this just talks about the different ways you can hook it up there is an s bus ppm mode if you have an s bus receiver rather than plugging in all the individual cables okay and it'll if you tell guys are you trying to read this and you can look at it there. But you don't need to read it. You're just going to watch the video and see what I do. Who reads manuals these days? Here's the other languages. I'm not going to go through anymore. If you don't read those languages, sorry. I was just sorry. telling him it was there. You don't have to read the It is there. But I just wanted you guys to know that it does exist. And we'll be looking for the center of gravity later. I'll be like, where's the center of gravity? Yes. So when we do these radio setups, we always like to go at a medium pace. <laughs> who's, who's determining medium these days? So let's turn on the transmitter. Oh, I need to make sure this is pointed away from you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna click back and cancel. It's gonna go to add new model. Okay, add new model brings you to this screen. Sorry, we have an unreleased plane. We may not be able to show you. Kind of depends on when this video publishes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna create it. Now I'm on 172 models, so it takes a long time. The more models you get, the slower it is creating the model. I don't know if that's something to do with the registers on the memory. Also, there is a, firmware update if you're just following along for the first time um i'm at like 1.8 or 1.6 i can't even remember what i'm at or 3.6 3.8 something like that but just check if spectrum has an update get the update at your earliest convenience and uh, do it just like i didn't <clears throat> okay so model select is where we just came from model type this is already set if you change that it's going to reset your model model name of course this is where you type in the name and the name of course is for us on the front of the box. Generally, that's what we try to go with. So we have a Ranger from FMS. So I'm gonna type FMS Ranger 1800 millimeters and we'll come right back. All right, so we have the FMS Ranger 1800 millimeters or 1.8 meters. 
okay? Aircraft type, this is where you set your wing type. We have a normal wing, no. We have a flap equipped wing, and we have a normal tail, and I'll scroll down to select image from standard. I think they have one that's similar, probably the carbon cub. Let's see what else we got here. Yeah, so we're probably gonna go with the carbon cup like this. Now keep in mind, you can not actually get floats for this. It's an optional choice. So obviously our box would be smaller. I'm not sure if it comes with the plane in the box or if they send you a separate box, but either way, we've had no problems with those. And one of the things we're doing here on this channel on Brian Phillips RC is we are currently going through engineering woes to build a giant pond out there so that we can fly float equipped planes on this property. And uh, we can't wait to share that with you, but it is gonna take us some time and considerable amount of money. A lot more than we were hoping. Yeah. All right, so aircraft type, flight mode setup. We don't need to set up flight modes in this configuration because we are using the AR620 as opposed to going with something that would be um, like a bind and fly, or if we went with the AR630 or 631 or 637T so that we could take full advantage of AS3X and safe and bypass the reflex or just rip it out of there, one or the other. We're gonna let the reflex work and we're just gonna use this to call out the mode with one of the channels, which we'll get to shortly. And so we don't need flight modes, but you could set up flight modes and have them tied to the channel with which set your mode. And you could have trims that are separate for each. We're not gonna do that because we've never really had a big problem with it, except for I think on the Challenger from OMP Hobby. Hmm. That had flap rounds, full length ailerons. So it would cause some weird changes, which I can show sometime on a video on a second thoughts. Smoke and flight mode, we aren't gonna set. So we'll walk back out. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna set is throttle cut. That's the most important safety issue. Switch H, looking down here, you can see it, it moves up and down and it's, whoop, it's because I did never actually acknowledge switch H. Okay, now you can see it's working. As I move the throttle stick, nothing happens. When I shut off throttle cut, it works like normal. So I'm gonna turn that back on, okay. Throttle curve we're not messing with. Uh, let's go to dual rates and expo. Okay, so I have a configuration that I like to set on switch F. I always start the same way, five, 10, and 20. Five, 10, and 20, and I drop my rates on the highest setting. This is gonna make the softest sticks. This is gonna be the middle, and this is gonna be the most touchy sticks. So we start in the middle, and if we don't like it, we put it to the setting that we think will improve. And then we set that to our new middle when we land. Okay. And then we double. So let's say, let's say that this was where we wanted it to be after the first landing. This would become five. That would be 2.5, also known as two. And this would be 10. And then we would take 90. And we'd probably put it to 100. Okay. All right. So then same thing is true for each of the three control axes. The primary controls are pitch, roll, and yaw. Okay, so five, and then 10, and then 20, with the rate down to 90, okay? That's where we're gonna start. And the same is true on rudder. So if you guys aren't noticing the pattern yet, the pattern is they're all the same, and they're always the same, and that's the way we like it, is something that is a consistent baseline from which to launch from. And then that gets us to the ground in a safe manner, because we have the middle setting, we have half and we have double. Double, of course, reducing our overall rates to 90%, but I would rather depend on Expo than I would on rates. And here's why. If you have a plane that you need to pitch this quick and you are only allowed to pitch it this quick, you're gonna crash into the trees or in this case, faucet, okay? Same thing is true for roll. Same thing is true for yaw. You want to have the ability to have a maximum throw without the touchiness at the center of the sticks because you share controls in the middle. And so for instance, when you move the throttle, it's very easy to get a little bit of rudder on accident, okay, without practice. Same thing is true with the elevator or the ailerons because it's a shared stick. You might accidentally give a little bit of aileron while you're going through your stroke, okay? These are learned behaviors. You can break yourself of these behaviors or you can just not be a machine and use Expo. All right, so dual rates and Expo set, throttle cut set. Now I wanna go to, we'll set up flaps to switch B 
And then we'll just leave them all neutral for now and we'll set the speed to two seconds. Now, the only reason we're doing that now is because I don't want the flaps to overdrive when we first initiate this system. So at this point, we're just gonna leave it there, okay? And we're not gonna do any mixing. Timer is gonna be five minutes initially. It's gonna be active. Anything over 25%, it's gonna start and continue to run. And then at one minute, we're gonna get a voice and then at 20 seconds, we're gonna get nothing. At 10 seconds, we're gonna get tone and vibrate, excuse me, we're gonna get voice. And then expiration is going to be tone and vibrate with a tone every minute thereafter. So that's everything you need to actually get the plane going. Throttle cuts on, putting our knobs to the center, making sure all our switches are where they need to be. And then we're gonna get ready to throw in this receiver. And you're like, Brian, why do you set up your basic setup before you plug in your receiver. Like you've already admitted you can't really do the elevator yet because you need the linkage installed. Well, the reason we do that is because I can go over one click by scrolling this way to the right and you can see where to go. Throttle, aileron, elevator, rudder, gear, flap. So gear is every, that's gonna be our mode. And you're like, but Brian, I don't want a two position mode. I want three positions. I want stabilizer on, I want off, and I want auto leveling. Okay, then you switch D. I'm gonna use switch A, which just happens to be gear, okay? I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have stabilizer, not AS3X. I'm gonna have stabilizer on, I'm gonna have auto leveling and stabilizer on. I'm not gonna make an off condition, but I could if I assigned it to D. Now, if I switch it to D, it could be stabilizer on, off, and then stabilizer on with auto leveling. Those are the three modes that are available in the reflex. All right, so let's talk about this. Wiring cable management 101. Do it now and do it later. Okay, so we're gonna take <laughs> off the canopy. We're gonna look inside of here. We've got all these wires here. This is where the wires that we plug into would go. Okay, so we have these wires. One says rudder. Where does rudder go, camera crew? Rudder goes on channel one, two, three, four. Okay, rudder goes on channel four. All right, brown is down. One, two, three, four. Yep, so that's right. How do we know brown is down? Because we looked at this earlier and minus was down, plus, and then S is top. S is signal, okay? All right, so what's next? Let's do whatever this one is. This is S, S bus PPM mode. So that'll be five. Because it's okay. gonna be here. So S is up, okay? I like to pull these down a little bit once I get it plugged in so I can see my cable management a little bit better. Okay, so just trying to grab them in the order that they, they unplug. Okay, so throttle, that's gonna go over here. Throttle's gonna go to port one, correct? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to plug this in upside down. You see the brown is up. The brown should be down, folks. So I almost made that mistake. And you know why I did make that mistake? Because the stupid label is under my fingers and I couldn't see it at the time. Come on, there it goes. Okay, and then the next one we're gonna do is whatever this one is, which is elevator. So channel three. Mm-hmm. Again, pulling the label back, brown is down. Channel three it is. Okay, and then the last of which is this which is gonna be ailerons. So I'm gonna put that right in the middle. Brown is down, pull that back just a little bit. Oh, excuse me, I wanna go between these two. Make sure I didn't tangle, I did not. Now, if you had an S bus PPM, you would only need to hook up this and it would carry all those together, okay? So now I'm gonna take this, make sure everything is sorted and comfortably, and then I'm going to I'm gonna tie a knot in it. Now you don't have to do this, but I'm doing this. If you guys don't like this, that's fine. You don't have to like it. You can do it if you want to, but you certainly don't have to like it. Okay, there we go. Get a nice little knot. And that's basically gonna give me a mechanism by which to carefully contain everything and then tie my wires, okay? And then everything is contained. It's all gonna go back there. And you're like, but that's gonna flop around. You're right, I'm gonna stick it under here and that's gonna stop it from flopping. 
And then I'm gonna have to reach in there and bind here in a second. But as you can see, that kind of does make a nice little pinch point for me. Hmm, that worked good. Okay. Now, maybe I'll try on top real quick because I feel like if I got a little better purchase that it would stay put better. I'd like it to go here, but I'm just afraid it ain't, it ain't gonna fit. I don't think it will, okay. So you guys see what I'm doing? I'm just kind of going in over the wires, taking my knot that I tied. And that knot is gonna give me a place to kind of pressure fit this thing. Oh yeah, I like it a lot. Now the pressure fit is right where it belongs. Okay, you guys see this? Now this little knot is going to give me a place to stuff it and then have it nice and carefully managed without a bunch of additional accessories. And when I need to bind this, I can reach in here and look where the prop is. Zzzz, not chopping my arm off. All right, so now the next move is we gotta do, we gotta talk about these two wires. These two wires are gonna really tick me off, I can already tell. Is it possible to move those? You see this? Which There's a little exit strategy right there where my index finger is, and yet we have this one that drops all the way forward. Why the heck did they go that way? That is so dumb. <sighs> Come on, FMS, what are you thinking about? So, there's the throttle. It could easily go up there. Let's just see, can it easily go up there? Because every single time you load your battery, you're gonna be fighting those stupid cables. I'm giving you the 100% guarantee on that. Yeah. Now, look what I'm gonna do, guys. It's gonna be like miraculous to watch. We have this thing and we have some forceps. This is a zip tie. Okay, it's got a little curvature to it. I'm gonna see, before I go through the trouble of unplugging all this crap, if I can feed this under. And the answer is looking very much like a yes. Yeah, there is zero excuse for that stupidity, okay? So now we have to reroute these stupid cables through the stupid hole. Why didn't they do that for us? See this, guys? See why I'm irritated? Because this throttle cable that I just did all the cable management with is gonna have to undo now. So what do I have to do to undo the throttle management, or I mean the cable management on the throttle, and then that other LED, it looks like a front facing landing light. I have to cut the zip tie that the manufacturer put in here, right there, like that, okay? Now I'm gonna untangle this monstrosity. We gotta plug in flaps too, hon. We never did plug in flaps. Oh. Okay, well, okay. I guess we gotta do more than what I was thinking. So folks, I apologize, I forgot to mention the flaps as well. And where are the flaps? Well, it looks like the flaps are the right length to go over to this without going through the knot. Okay, yeah, I guess we're okay there. Now, let's talk about this throttle cable. This throttle cable comes, looks like the black goes to that side, which is, Gonna be hard to remember. The black goes to, no, it goes to the back, okay? Okay. So the black goes to the back on the throttle. Okay, now it's unplugged. And we have to get this LED cable as well, okay? So no excuse for this stupidity at all. Okay, now I'm gonna take these two wires, I'm gonna put them together, I'm gonna pull back the throttle just a little bit. And how are we gonna attach these and pull them through? That's a great question. But now that we know that they go, this becomes a matter of just doing it, okay? Be nice if I could just tie it on there, but it's not gonna ever be quite that easy. So my next move is I have to either find a bigger zip tie or some sort of an apparatus that I can reach under and through, and then we will come right back. I'm lazy. <laughs> I'm just gonna tape it onto this zip tie, okay? And all, I mean, this doesn't have to be perfect. This just has to get it through the hole, guys. Okay, so once we pass these through, then we should be golden here. But all we're doing is just cable management that shouldn't have had to be done in the first place. That's why these steps kind of frustrate me because this plate is well designed and then somebody like didn't take advantage of it. Or somebody replaced the ESC at one point during production, which is fine. Okay, so look at this, there it goes. It's popping up through. Now that it's popping up through, I can grab this and walk it through gently so it doesn't undo the tape. Okay, so there it is. And now we're through, guys. See, 
What was so hard about that? Way better. Way, way better, okay? So now that we have that, we won't have to trip over those stupid cables till the end of time. Because let me, let me tell you something, guys. There's nothing more frustrating than having stupid cables in the stupid way every time you put in your battery in. And I mean every single time you put your battery in, you're gonna have this wire that's getting pinched underneath the surface of where your battery is. Now, we do have one other shelf liner trick that we have to do. And the shelf liner trick is gonna come in just a second, but I figured I was walking by, so I'll grab this. The shelf liner trick is the biggest, easiest, no-brainer ever in the history of rc -dom. Seriously. <laughs> okay. All right, so now let's get these wires landed back. So you can see here, there is some sort of a control channel for the LEDs. And I don't know what all they're gonna do, but it looks like the lights do need to be plugged into something. Okay, well, that's annoying. I didn't realize that. So you see this? So the lights have to plug in somewhere. Well, I guess we can plug it into the battery connection. How about that then? See that? Battery is gonna still give us a parallel connection here. Okay, so now we have all that crap plugged in and we have it routed, but we have to get the throttle plugged into the, the actual reflex first, okay? You see how I'm doing this? I'm gonna grab the front and the back of this. Do you see what I did? I, I, clipped the, I clipped the forceps, but you see how it's not gonna let me get in there? That's unfortunate, but I can still get through because all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start this you're gonna have to hold still because every time you move, the shadow Sorry. confuses my brain. Okay. Okay, so that's started. Then I'm gonna pop that off and I'm gonna put my hand back here and probably block your view. And I'm gonna press that into the reflex. See how it's pressed in? Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna take this and I have to somehow do a little bit of cable management now and I'm gonna stuff that back to right pretty much where it was exactly before. And that does have a nice little pinch to it, which is great because now all that wire, all that mass of wire, I'm just gonna literally push it to the side. Okay, now we can take our little Velcro squares. There's two of them because there's a giant gap in the middle, okay? This giant gap in the middle is a little bit annoying. You see what I did there? I put that off to the side so it's out of the way of where the battery is gonna lay. Okay. It'd be really nice if I could fit that through this opening back here, but I don't think that XT60 is gonna go through. Okay, so now we've got these two pieces of Velcro. And you're probably thinking, yeah, so now you're gonna, now you're gonna take that and stick it on your brand new battery. Ha <laughs> ha! No, I'm not gonna do that. Are you kidding? Nope. I'm gonna do the way, 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 way easier and way more effective method, which is, I'm gonna peel this off if I could ever get it to peel. I'm gonna stick it to the shelf liner. And you're like, what the heck is shelf liner? I'm a man. Just open your wife's drawer and- Go to your kitchen, open a drawer. Drawers. Does everything fling out at you murderously? Then you probably don't have shelf liner. If it stops as soon as the door slams open, then you probably do have shelf liner, okay? Shelf liner is the cheapest thing that you can buy on the face of the earth. This whole thing will cost you like $10 and you'll use it for like a million planes. Okay, if you have a million planes, I'm jealous of you. That's a lot of planes. Okay, so once you're done with that, then you just cut this. And all this is is just like a non-stick pad that's gonna make anything that's got a little bit of friction, it's gonna put friction in there, okay? So instead of having wood on a battery, you have a little bit of friction pad on a battery, okay? And that's literally all you have to do. It's so simple and it's so effective and it literally does actually work. And that's part of the reason why we share this stuff on Brian Phillips RC is that we actually wanna make your lives better. And yes, that does mean sometimes you have to watch a little bit longer video and you might get questions in your head while you're watching that we don't answer. And for that reason, we try our best to get through some of the comments but if you want the best crack at success with reaching us for comments, questions like that, my best suggestion would be to begin being a Patreon. This battery is done. This 4004S happens to be done, so I just grabbed the one that was done. There's one that's at like 89%. So I'll show you how this works now. So I'm gonna slide this in. And we have to finish our radio setup, of course. So we got these high quality FMS 
This is the kind that's kind of like uh, really strong and sturdy and doesn't, it doesn't make you nervous like it's gonna rip. And I'm gonna undo both. Now we don't know how the CG is gonna work out in this plane yet, but uh, we will after we fly it or after we finish our setup because we'll test the CG. I'm just gonna go, you know, more or less centered and I'm gonna put it that direction. That's the other reason why Velcro is annoying because I would have put that Velcro on I would have probably had it so the wire was coming out the other side and then all of a sudden you can't use this battery in this plane. Or at least you'd have to put Velcro on the other side too, okay? So now this is also a good test is when they slip free, that means that they didn't screw the pooch and put them in upside down or glue them on the bottom, okay? So now that you've got a little bit of pressure pressing down on that, you can like literally move the entire plane from that binding point, okay? Now keep in mind, it's not necessarily about the friction that's been administered. It's about the, the friction being more than 0% friction. Okay, because you can only put so much friction by actually holding down with Velcro straps um, or hook and loop straps, which is what the manufacturers would prefer us call them because they're probably not actually Velcro. That's a name brand. But you guys see what I'm talking about? Look, I can pick up the plane by this. I mean, it might be kind of awkward to do that for a long time because it's an awkward bite point. But then this gets held and you really, really have to work hard to make it slip, okay? Otherwise you end up breaking this wood, this plywood will actually break because you have to pull the strap so dang hard. Now, if you put Velcro on the bottom of your batteries, it'll hold it in place with or without the strap, um, but the strap helps to reinforce that, okay? So that would be a close second. All right, now you can see here, all this wire, this giant monstrosity of mess here, see that? That is gonna end up driving me crazy because I guarantee it's gonna get flopped around in there. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take my hand, I make a fist around all those wires. Now when I let go, watch how it is. Okay, I'm gonna try to slide my hand out. See how it's in a nice little bundle? Mm -hmm. Guess what I'm gonna do with that bundle? Just zip tie it in the middle. It's like you know me. <laughs> I'm gonna take one big zip tie and I'm gonna desperately try to get it around all that crap. And then I'm gonna desperately try to pull the tails toward me so I can desperately try to tighten it together. And when I say desperately, I mean, goodness gracious, it's awkward. So, as you can see, now that I've got my hand around it, I'm gonna start the zip tie, but I'm not gonna pull it all the way tight until I get it in a position where I like all the wiring. Okay, you guys see what I'm doing here? Not rocket science, unless this was a rocket ship and then it would be rocket science. This is just airplane science. Okay, you guys see what's going on now? Now it's one big chunk and I still didn't get the result I wanted, but it's good enough because it's gonna kind of hold it in that general vicinity and position. Okay? And what would have been better is if I would have caught all those Y cables and everything down there. But I didn't and that's life in the big city because it's still better than it was, and it hopefully won't flop as bad as it would have otherwise. Yeah. Okay, so the next move is to energize this. Now you'll notice that there's a prop on here, and I've got a lanyard that I would normally have on my transmitter. I wanna move that out of the way just to be on the safe side and get sucked into a prop that's spinning. I wanna put this thing and this thing in different spots. The camera crew is gonna throw the zip tie in the garbage can. And the reason we're doing this little cleanup is because if the prop were to start, I don't want it to throw something across the room like we've done a million times on this channel. Throwing like, things across the room? Like instruction manuals. <laughs> and white so now that everything is out of the way, we got a clean start. We're gonna go ahead and walk out of this menu. Okay, throttle cuts on, throttle stick is down. Click, scroll down to bind. Be prepared to bind. Nothing's gonna happen. That's how quick it times out, okay? Bind, have it ready. Plugging it in with my hands in a position where I can move them out of the way of the prop if it would start, which it shouldn't. Holy cow, that XT60 is hard to plug into. Now, while we're initiating, I'm gonna press the bind button. And since I can see it now, you're gonna have to really work if you wanna see that. See, binding, it's right there. I can see the flash. 
So normally I would have been in a different position because I didn't want to be at risk or teach you guys to do that in a way that you're at risk, but the camera crew was trying to get a shot and she did not evidently understand what I wanted to do. I wanted to keep my elbows away from this and I moved because it wasn't starting and I can hear the ESC arm, okay? If you're new to the hobby, leave the prop off until the end is the safest bet. Okay, you can see my flaps are in the middle position. My elevator's not hooked up. Ailerons are moving. I was gonna move this back over there. Oh, so nothing's moving in the right direction. Ailerons are moving in the wrong direction. Elevator's not moving, and the rudder is moving in the right direction. The flaps have not been configured yet, so that's no problem. We're just gonna walk this and flip it around. And why is that critical? Because I wanna be able to see what direction it's going, but we haven't vetted the throttle. Throttle's down, throttle cuts on. Nothing should happen, nothing did. Throttle cuts off, it didn't start on its own, that's good. And it is working and it's blowing air at me. Throttle cut works and it's been tested. Now I can trust this system enough to continue to the next step. Okay, I'm clearing my timer because I don't really care about the timer. I'm gonna actually probably do that. Okay, now we need to set up all the control surfaces, which means we're gonna have to do the elevator linkage. The elevator linkage looks like this. And we have flashing LEDs on the wingtips. Come on, man. Yep, we have flashing wingtip LEDs and we have a solid nose light. Okay, so we're gonna have to figure out if we can switch those two. All right, looking at this, looking at this, this needs to go in on the underside of that. I'm probably gonna have to get the plane stand out because I can't do that. Just, we'll pause for a sec. Okay, so this linkage needs to be installed, but as you can see, the elevator's in the wrong position, or excuse me, the ailerons are trying to auto level the plane. Flip my gear switch and it goes to normal flight mode. I'm gonna click or stabilized. I'm gonna go down to servo setup. I'm gonna go from travel over to reverse. I'm gonna reverse gear. I already know I have to reverse the ailerons too, just cause I noticed it earlier. And then we'll walk out. Okay, now, why do we care? Because I want this to be in normal mode with the stabilizer off or I want the stabilizer on, but not auto leveling. Auto leveling can change the position of the elevator while we're doing this critical step of trying to get this straight. Okay, see how this moves up and down? You're gonna hold it here, right? Well, not, not you, just the person at home. Okay. So this is gonna get pressed on here and then it's gonna go in there on the outside hole. So that's obviously not, it's not that far off. So I'm gonna slide this in. Now, how do you do that? You just kind of walk it in, get to the first turn, and then just work it without breaking it, okay? Now, I like to hold this control surface and then just hold this next to it. You see, I've got my, my pointer finger as a flat and my thumb as a flat. So we're not quite there, we gotta go in a little bit. So there's two turns, one and a half. Okay, another half turn probably. And then look at that, that's pretty close, another half a turn. Oh yeah, it's getting pretty dang close. So now, just simulate by pressing in here. Do we have flush? Do we have flush? We're dang close. If it's not perfect, it'll be perfect enough. Then I'm gonna press this, and you'll notice it's really hard to actually get purchase without stabbing yourself in the thumb. So there's two ways to do it. You can use needle nose pliers or you can use the right tool for the job. The right tool for the job is one of these. So, I always get that wrong. It'll kind of line up with the screw, snaps it in. Okay, this is also a tool that's used to then pull them apart as well. And so this, this is a handy tool and it's something that you might wanna have in your tool bag, but you don't have to have it in your tool bag if you don't do a ton of these ball links. If you're primarily an airplane guy and you don't use a lot of ball links, but you just get them on the planes that you buy that are ready to fly or plug and fly, my suggestion, if you want to compromise, would be probably to use needle nose pliers, okay? So now I'm gonna go ahead and put my canopy, or not my canopy, but my hood and canopy on, front windshield, windscreen. I'm gonna drop that on. That is very frustrating there's no plastic to receive that pin. That pin is gonna make a big dent. Mm -hmm. It already has made a dent. So what you're gonna do now, we have to get the flap set up and we have to make sure all the control surfaces are moving in the right direction. Then we can test if they're correcting 
in the right direction. And I hope you guys heard that second part. If they're correcting in the wrong direction, then that's what you need to fix next. Elevator goes up, elevator goes down. Rolls left, rolls right. You have to look at both surfaces. One surface could, can be wrong and the other can be right. There and there, okay? Now flaps aren't set up, so camera crew is gonna stand here. We're gonna show you the flap setup. Click, scroll down to flaps. I'm just gonna guess, because I don't know which way it's gonna go. Look at the flaps. See, wrong way, okay? So I want this to start from zero. I'm gonna go to minus. There's minus 100 and you can see we're drooping just a little bit, okay? Not the end of the world, we'll figure that out in a minute. Now there's, you know, something like a takeoff flap, landing flap, okay? So as you can see, they're going down. That's 100, okay? I wanna just double check we're not binding. You're gonna check too. Oh yeah, we got lots of room before we would bind, okay? So that means the next thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and expand our reach by clicking, going into servo setup, going down to flaps, go to the middle. I'm gonna just open them up to like 125. Okay, now look, landing flaps are still fine. Normal is pretty dang good. So 125 seems about right. And if you want more barn doors, you just put it into the landing setting. And you go all the way up to 150. I like to back it off by about five. That way you don't have a bind and you don't have a mechanical or a software driven issue. Yeah, so we're not running into anything, so that's good. Okay, so then let's talk about takeoff flaps. Takeoff flaps are there. Let's look in them. Let's look in the flap system. I'll probably do them like that. That'll be my takeoff flap. So it'll be like not as much flaps and then barn doors for landing, okay? So I chose to do minus 100, minus, one, uh, minus 20, then plus 100. The elevator correction's probably going to be something like, let's do like eight and 12. And the reason we're doing so much correction is just, now you wanna see this go down. Yep, down and then down further. Okay, very good. All right, so roll left, roll right, elevator up, elevator down, yaw left, yaw right, and the steerable is doing the right thing, which is important. Okay, so all the control surfaces are moving in the right direction. Now we need to know if it's correcting in the right direction. Now correction is gonna come from the flight controller and there's two modes of action because we have it tied to gear. Gear is by default on switch A, which is right here. It's a two position switch. There's this switch for normal flight and this for auto leveling. How do I know that's auto leveling? Well, here's two things you can do. I'm gonna walk all the way out to the regular mode. I'm gonna pull the sticks like this, go to auto leveling. You can see a small disparity in position. They get smaller in auto leveling and they get bigger in normal. Now it's so small, admittedly, I wouldn't depend on that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I've already vetted that the throttle cut is working. I'm gonna put it in normal mode and when I flip this over, I won't see the ailerons or the elevator. See the ele elevator's not trying to correct. Okay, I'm gonna try to correct by turning on auto leveling. See it? There you go. So now it's level. Now watch the ailerons as I roll it over. It's gonna try to find the quickest path to center. See that? That's a very good way to test if you're in auto leveling. I'm out of auto leveling now. Roll it on its back, nothing, okay? Look at the elevator, nothing, okay? Now I'm gonna move this. I'm gonna move the plane and look for the yaw on the rudder. Yep, it's going that way. Yep, it's going toward the camera crew. Toward the camera crew. Toward the camera crew. Toward the window. Toward the camera crew. It's going and resisting the impact of the movement of the plane notwithstanding input impact from the, the sticks. Elevator's going down, elevator's going up, going down, going up, going down. I'll give you guys a better shot of this in a minute. Aileron going up, aileron going down, double check, going up, going down. Now, the way I see this is different than the way you see it on camera. Looking at the elevator, I'm gonna go up, it goes up, I'm gonna go down, it goes down. Look at the edge of the wing it's harder to see on this plane. See how it goes up, it goes down. Now look at the rudder. Rudder goes toward the camera crew, goes toward the TV, toward the window. Now back toward the TV, toward the camera crew. As I spin, it's gonna move to resist, and that's how you can tell, okay? Hard to demonstrate that on camera for certain planes because it's not as easy to appreciate and see. This plane's pretty easy to see. 
And I'm quite excited to fly this thing. In fact, I kind of can't wait to get it in the air. I'm not happy about the flashing nav lights. I do not like flashing nav lights. I want my nav lights on. So let's see if we can fix that right now. I actually don't even care if the landing light is solid, but I like solid landing lights too. So let's talk about this. Okay, there was a little black box right here. You see that black box right there? That goes out to a splitter, okay? The splitter has two different combos, here and here. One has our landing lights. So unfortunately for me, I'm gonna probably have to cut that off, the zip tie, and I'm gonna have to do a Y cable. Oh. So I'm gonna carefully get in here, not cut my other cables, and I'm gonna pull that out. Then I'm gonna take this. Okay, so there's, look at the wing tip. Does it stop? Yes. Does it go flash? Flash. Okay. So here's what I need to do. I'm gonna take out this flasher, guys. See this? This is gonna unplug right here and right now. Come on. Okay, so that's how I'll unplug. My nav lights are off, correct? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna take this and unplug it. I'm gonna take this and unplug it. This is a flashing sequencer sort of thing. So I can put this in my bag of tricks. Now, just full disclosure, yours will come with the same thing and you get to decide if you wanna do this, but this isn't included. Because you don't have enough splitters to do this, you would have to do some soldering if you don't have a Y cable, but for goodness sakes, you should have a Y cable from some plane. Also, you can look at the way we tap the battery. We can take out this dual and do a triple. That's the other thing you could do. That's probably what we'll do. We'll just pull this out, we'll do a triple. So this is gonna shut off the nose gear. Okay, see that, watch the nose gear. No, nose light, rather. Yep. Just off. shut off, mm -hmm. okay? So now I can unplug this one too. All right, so I've got this. This has lights on it. So let me just find one in my bag of tricks here. I know for a fact I got a few that are triples. Oh, look, this one says lights and it's got four. We'll save that for a project where we need four. I think I have a couple in here that are trifectas, like this. Hey, there we go. There's a trifecta. Okay, so all we're concerning ourselves with is the brown and the black. Okay, so just line up your polarity. Red goes to the center, plug it in, okay, boom. Then back here, you've got these two wires that come down. They're gonna go to your left and your right side of your wing. So I'm just gonna plug in the brown to the outside. Oops. And all we're doing is we're just giving constant power and it's already been current limited resisted, current resisted, current limited, because this is going through an electronic circuit, in this case, the receiver, okay? So we have these three wires. Now watch what happens. All the lights are gonna come on at once. Watch this, ready, set, on they are. Okay. Solid, right. solid, and off. Why is that one not on? I, that last one, did you plug it in backwards? Well, it would have been nice if you'd said that if you saw me do it. I didn't see it fast enough. Hmm, no, I didn't plug it in backward. But I'm just double checking something. Which one shut off? The red one? No. Red is on, green is on, nose is off. So this one is not turning on and I don't know why, so I'm gonna go ahead and reverse polarity and see if it turns on. Nope, nothing, mm -hmm. right? No. Hmm, maybe our Y cable's messed up. Okay, I'm gonna just trade for either of the other two. This is Troubleshooting 101. Okay, red, red is Red just off. shut off? Yep. Okay. I'm gonna go with this in the same orientation, red being the center. There's the light, the light just came on. Yes. Okay, so now I'm gonna plug back in the same light. Red is on. Red is on. All right, so now when we plug into this one, if it doesn't start, we'll know where to start looking for a problem. Okay. Is it on? No. Okay, so there must be something wrong with this pin, with, with this actual splitter. Well, that explains why we have it extra in here. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Better to find that out now than when it's being used in another plane. So I'm gonna just teach you guys a trick. This is a trick that's hard for a hoarder like me to do. I'm gonna show you this trick, watch this trick. There's the messed up cable. I bet you anything, one of those three wires is broke. So I'm just gonna do the old trusty cut it off. Okay? Okay. If you cut it off, 
it's either bad on that side or it's bad on this side. But now I can take these three wires and I can cut them at different lengths so that they don't tempt fate and touch each other. And then you can tape over this and that becomes a Y cable, okay? That's the very quick and dirty way to fix that. And when I say fix, I use the term facetiously because I didn't fix anything. I just cut off the length. But you know what? I'd rather find out this way than find out when I got some $700 plane that's depending on that control working. Right. Okay, so we actually kind of lucked out there. And that's part of the reason why you watch Brian Phillips RC is because not only do I crash my planes, but I help you not crash yours, hopefully. All right, great, so we'll lay that down. That trifecta did not work. We have a quad, we have a double, we have a double, we have a double, we have a double, 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 single. Du oh, there. triple for a gear. This was for a gear on something. So I'm gonna go ahead and take off the gear label and we'll try again. We're gonna do the exact same thing, guys. We'll pause while we do it and come back and let you know if it worked. Okay, so as you can see, we got three wires attached. We have three lights working and now we can just, uh, basically take our receiver and slide it back into position. Now, if you like the flashing lights, I don't mean to make anybody feel bad. That is a preference issue for me, and it may not be for you. We may not share that opinion. It is just that, an opinion. I am allowed to have opinions, even though we may not agree. And you are allowed to have opinions, even though we may not agree. But I don't like flashing lights, and I'll tell you why right now, so that you can know you're wrong. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, when I'm coming in for final, and it's a dark night, or it's very low light and I go into behind a tree, the plane will disappear. I don't wanna wait for this. Right. Because a lot of times between this and this comes out a tree and just goes <laughs> I only know from tons of experience. <laughs> so that's when I lose plane. I mean, I actually haven't lost one on camera that way for a long time. But the truth, usually I do that in perfect lighting. Right. Um, because those trees, those 40 year old trees just jump out from nowhere. But the truth is, um, I don't like flashing LEDs on my wingtips. I want solid wingtip lights and I want solid landing lights if at all possible. It's kind of cool to have flashing landing lights that you can toggle between flashing and not flashing. That's cool. Because there are times you're just going for cool effects and then there's other times you're like, hey, I'd just like to see my plane live. Or if you have a flashing like a lot of planes will have a flashing white strobe on the wingtip, right? And then your solid nav light. Strobe light, 100%, totally cool. Nav light, no, no way, Jose. In real life, yes, there are a lot of people that use a beacon combination. And then there's sometimes like a beacon inside on the belly of the plane, but we don't have a belly light on this one. I'm gonna pause and get another zip tie and zip tie this and we'll come back and show you what it looks like. All right, so we got one zip tie in there now. So as you can see, it's just kind of a nice little get out of the way sort of package there. All right, so now the next step we need to do is we need to set up our uh, center of gravity and we don't really have to set anything up so much as we have to mark it. So if you guys don't know how to mark the center of gravity, it's a pretty easy process. You don't have to absolutely mark it, but you do have to at least mark where your batteries go. If you're gonna test it without marking it, that's fine. Okay, so we like to use calipers Calipers make this easy. 75 to 85, okay. okay. So I open my calipers to 75. Doesn't need to be exact, but it needs to be close, okay. Now I'm not gonna hold this upside down, so I need to mark the underside. So actually, I probably need to get the plane stand, we'll come right back. So 75, we're gonna mark this. Okay, it's easier to make sure you can get your hand in where you're gonna be able to reach in and mark than it is, dang it, you see what I just did? These foam planes, man, if you catch them with something sharp like this, it's gonna be damage. Uh, 75 to 85, so I'm gonna go to 85 now. So as you can see, it's not perfect, but it doesn't matter, it's close enough. And I'm gonna put this on the leading edge. Okay, and then I'm gonna take and just highlight it with this marker. And then I usually kind of dive the tip in so we get the same size depression on both sides. Now, it is nice because then I can feel that depression and I know what I'm actually reaching for. I accidentally bumped this when I went over 
So I'm gonna go back just a hair. Now in my case, I can tighten this thing down, which I almost never do, okay? And then if you're concerned about damaging the finish on your plane, sometimes you do this on a plane that's got a paint finish or whatever, and it's a little bit harder to see those depressions. And so we will subsequently change the color that we pick for the marking. Now, you don't actually have to make the mark. The other trick that I do, and I do this a lot, but I also mark the center of gravity, is I will take the plane. Let's test it first, and I'll show you the trick. Okay, so I'm on the back hole, and it's not leaning forward too bad, so that's fine. I'm on the front hole, and it's leaning back a little bit, but it's leaning a lot less for, forward than it is backward. Okay, so I can move the plane stand sort of to the side. So what that tells me is I'm tending toward tail heavy, but I'm not like super tail heavy, okay? So I'm gonna open this, and that tells me I can move this battery forward just a little bit, okay? Now, let's just see for grins if I can just go to the firewall, okay? Now we know we're gonna run 4,000 milliamp hour 4S, okay? Now, when I'm done, I'll mark one extremity and I'll draw an arrow. And the arrow is gonna indicate to me which direction the lead is gonna go, okay? So keeping in mind, putting this back in, dropping that down, I'd like to put a piece of clear tape across here to give me something to press against. Mm -hmm. Now I can find these depressions. And again, this is why you test your, your, your prop and everything. Okay, so it's leaning forward just a little bit and it's leaning backward a little bit. So we're actually perfect there. So I would say that's a better place to start than where we originally had it, which was kind of centered on the straps. So now we just have one strap to deal with and I can draw a line like this and then I can draw an arrow, okay? So that's 4,000 with the arrow going that way. Now the 3,200, it's gonna be the same scenario. It's gonna be all the way forward. And we've noticed that about two planes that we've done in very recent history for FMS, one of which was this P51. We put a considerably larger battery in that plane and we barely got it to center of gravity, okay? All the way to the firewall, and I'm talking all, all the way, okay? So you don't always get what you expect on your center of gravity. Now that we have moved this, we've also lost some of our shelf liner, which is gonna be helping to keep this from sliding. So you wanna then double recheck that you have enough purchase on there that it's not gonna move, and it's not gonna move. I am totally comfortable with that. Also, that's an easier way for us to put it in because I'm only gonna be dinking with one strap. And a lot of times you can reorganize the straps in your planes if you're unsure of your position there. Now, also let's talk about voltage alarms real quick because we're pretty much done setting this up. And it looks like we have reasonably good weather outside. So the camera crew and I are probably gonna go fly as soon as we're done. You'll see the maiden flight in a different video. So if you're just watching this now and you're like, ah, oh, man, I watched this whole thing waiting for you to fly. Well, it's available right now, unless you started this one minute ago. Because we usually publish these videos one minute ahead of the actual flight, mm -hmm. okay? More people watch the flights and that's fine. Oh, I definitely grabbed the wrong one. That one's a crashed one. <laughs> that, yeah, this one, this one's a good one. They do tend to see a lot of life, okay? Voltage alarms for us are a big part of our initial flights. Okay, so as you can see, 16.7 volts, cell number one's at 4.17, cell number two's at 4.18, number three at 4.17, number four at 4.18. Now, I do trust that that's probably about correct, and we have done our radio setup with this same battery plugged in, but that's close enough to maiden on, in my opinion, okay? Now, sometimes you're gonna tend to get, you know, those extra couple tenths of a, of a volt um, can matter. And so if you ever watch our videos and you think, geez, Brian, you didn't get a very long flight time, which you'll probably never say, then uh, that might be an explanation for why. <laughs> but we just did all our radio set up with this battery plugged in. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay this down and let you guys have a couple seconds to look at this plane again, and then just think of awesome questions that you didn't know you even had. And if you do have questions and you wanna leave them in the comments below, then those questions in the comments below will be looked at by yours truly or the camera crew or one of us or both of us, depending on what the nature of the comment is. We'll try our best to answer them. 
We used to get back with everybody on 100% of comments, notwithstanding the most egregious comments that were ridiculous, which do happen still. But we have found it to be almost impossible to keep up with the commentary. We do our best. Um, so if we don't get to you immediately, it might take us a little bit of time, but we do try to get around to them. And then the other thing is, if you want to have access to us for comments, which is not a defined benefit of Patreon, otherwise we'd have to charge VAT for anybody that's overseas. For those of you in America, that's a value added tax. And it's basically a tax that's added to anything for no reason. Yep. Uh, coming to America soon. But in this case, we want to make sure that we don't clearly define that uh, because it's not a guarantee you don't have to pay taxes on your gifts to us, which is nice because after all, that just means you pay more and we get less and that's stupid for everybody. Um, so Patreon is a good way to get in our ears for comments, even though it's not a plan def defined benefit. Same thing with members on YouTube, uh, but we are sort of still trying to work out exactly how to do that because it's a new thing for us. And then we have uh, super thanks. We have a way to sort, sort comments that way. And then we also have PayPal, which is just a direct way to support us financially. But we still firmly believe the best way to support us financially is if you're gonna support us financially by buying planes from the links, it helps. We occasionally get comments from people that say, hey, I didn't buy it from your links, but thanks for the video. If you're gonna thank us for buying a plane somewhere else, that's like, it's like going to the Chevy dealer of your choice and then like spending a week with the salesman and then going across the street and buying it from the other guy. That's exactly the same process. So maybe just like, don't tell me and just the next time buy from the link. Cause we know that there's always a good reason and you guys aren't trying to burn bridges or upset us or anything like that. And there might even be a great deal that's on your shelf right now at the shop you know, your local hobby shop and you can't get it because it's out of stock or whatever. There's a million reasons. But at the end of the day, just remember that is how we make this work. So if you choose not to do that and you want to like throw us a couple of bucks, that's fine. However you do it is fine. We just want you guys to be watching the videos and really we want you to be flying. So we are very happy to have you here. We're very happy to have your attention for these videos and we hope that we have helped to get you in the air. Because remember at this point, this plane, I could go out and fly it. And incidentally, I'm gonna be flying it in like two minutes. So I'm super excited. I think it's gonna be a great plane. We've had really good luck with our FMS models. One notable difference on this compared to the Carbon Z Cessna 150T is of course that one is set up as a tail dragger now. The original Cessna 150 was actually set up with a tricycle gear just like this. Some people had some problems with the nose gear. It looks like this nose gear is pretty resilient though. So I'm excited for that. Um, also, I know that there's no thrust reverse on this current Predator ESC, but it would be very easy to swap out this ESC for an Avian. And in our current configuration, you should be able to run thrust reverse, except you might want to lean toward just getting a 630 and then replacing the ES, uh, excuse me, the uh, reflex in mm -hmm. this case. So buy this as a plug and play, get the reflex, um, on another model or buy this with the reflex, use the reflex on another model. You can reprogram it to a different model if you want, but you're gonna be limited to the ones that FMS offers. So you have to find the closest match if you're putting it in some competitive brand. Um, also, that being said, if you don't need AS3X and safe, you can tear out that reflex and you can just go uh, straight to the control surfaces. And remember, you got the lights and stuff. You may need another Y cable uh, if you wanna run that stuff. And also, if you put an Avian in, just keep in mind that they use a serial communication over the bus of cabling. So that is one factor. Whereas if you buy another Predator that comes with the yellow additional line, you've got the three lines, the red, white, and black, then you'll have a yellow. That yellow just goes into the signal of another channel on uh, the same receiver that you're using to control the plane. And you toggle that up or down and it will change the condition of the direction of travel. There'll be a beep. And you can see that if you're curious on that P47 back there, that is actually the 1.2 meter. I apologize. There's a 1.5 meter we did for FMS. That was where we realized that that cable could be used. We've done it in a number of other planes and we've had varying success. The F15, we had thrust reverse in it. The only thing that didn't work on that was a pilot fatigue because the transition was too fast 
it did not respond and ended up crashing because of it, which you can mm -hmm. see there. Also 1.4 meter T28, yep. similar to this. We did use thrust reverse, but we did it on a six channel. We locked stabilizer on and we split the channel for the flap so that we could have stabilizer on, or excuse me, what did we do, gear or something like that? I can't remember, no, thrust reverse was part of that channel. Yes. But we were forcing full flaps before thrust reverse was available, which means that it always wants to tip on its tail because <laughs> the flaps go down and then it's pushing and it kind of creates a downward, downward angle. So hopefully we haven't overwhelmed you with weird details at the end here. We try not to do that, but this plane looks like it's gonna be amazing. I cannot wait to get it in the air. We love working with FMS products. We pick them apart just like everybody else. But at the end of the day, guys, flashing LEDs, I can put up with that as a complaint because to be honest with you, it cost me like no dollars and no cents to switch it. Yeah. And if I had a Y cable, I could have done the same thing, but I just wanted to do it with a trifecta. It'd be a little cleaner. But with soldering iron, a little bit of effort, I could have done it without any parts. Also, I really like the way this went together. It's really easy to put together. It'll be really easy to take apart if you need to take it apart for transit. You've got one pin and two screws on each side. Very easy to put those screws in. We'd have any problems. And then guess what? All the lights, all the flaps, all the ailerons, everything stays intact. And then all you've got is just the fuse and the tail and all that. In fact, you can take that apart pretty easy too. Mm -hmm. But I would not suggest taking things apart every time unless you absolutely have to. It just seems like that's when things get broke. So main wings come off, or in your case, maybe you've got a car and you can only fit one wing. Just take one wing off. You'll be fine. And uh, you don't have to worry about wires. It's got a quick disconnect. So also when you go to put them back together, always make sure you're doing a check to see all the surfaces move. And I'm talking about all and the lights. Don't just double check that one moves because you may have contact with one of the pins and not the other because it's at a bit of an angle. Okay. Hmm. Other than that, guys, we're ready to rock and roll. And also you've got redundant controls for your ailerons, but you don't have redundancy on your flap. So if you had one flap that wasn't working, you could actually create a huge asymmetry that you couldn't overwhelm potentially with your ailerons. I've had that happen before. It's a little bit weird, but I was fortunate enough to notice it in time and respond. So anyway, a very cool plane. Cannot wait to get this in the air. It's gonna pair up nicely with the NX-10. Again, you could do it with the NX-6, you could do it with the NX-8, you could do it with the NX-10 like we did, but the truth is we wanna, we wanna give you guys the best chance at future success, and if you're spending like say $700 on transmitters before you get to this, and then you have to buy this anyway, you've wasted a lot of money. But there again, if you're doing it following our links, you do help us along the way. It's just that, you know, why don't you just go where you're going? And then you don't have to spend money on those. Plus the six comes with that seventh channel, which is sort of like half. And you really want to have this knob when you start setting up plug and, plug and plays with the Spectrum gear, because then you can use your master gain on those. I have yet to use these, by the way. Mm -hmm. But someday I will. Yeah. And it's good to have them in case you need them. I'm more concerned about the additional channels that ride over the pluggable channels in all the AS3X equipped gear because then I'm able to set up the master gains and things like that mm -hmm. and not give up an actual practical channel I can use to do something with. All right, guys, hopefully we answered all your questions. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you on the next one right around the corner here on Brian Phillips RC.